T I N G A L E. Just like it sounds. Oh, okay. Joseph Alexander. Now, the publishing company is called Fundamental Changes. And, and Amazon put this, this uh, thing that they, that they wrote about them. Amazon calls them the most successful independent music tuition publishers in the world. As of recently, they just, you know, so they're they're doing right now they're doing Rosenwinkel. They've, they've been after me to, to put together a book of uh, chord moves, you know. Wow. So uh, we we started and then they're doing all the hard work. And uh, anyway, it's uh, it's well on it on its way, you know. Great. I'm gonna definitely gonna need a copy of that. Yeah. Well, you'll get one. We'll, we'll, <laughs> and I also got permission you know if if you you don't have to but if you're going to mention it you know i have all the chuck wayne things you know things like like something like this which is i don't know if you can see that or if it makes any sense but anyway this is like an arpeggio that that chuck did and 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 this is his chord uh, uh so that he did oh, okay. all four note, wow. four note on four, uh, on four strings of the the bottom, you know they're all do uh, dominant, but you can you you can change the dominant, lowering the third or or, or raising the, to the major seventh, and so you can create a whole sequence of small chords, mm -hmm. you know, and. Uh, Wow, I, I can't wait to check that out. That's going to be fantastic. Yeah, it's it's going to be good, and and it'll be a series of. I want it to be like an ongoing guide because, uh, and I'm just uh, figuring a lot of moves that I would play normally, like two five ones with moving, you know, in minor and major, and one in one six two five, and 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 moving notes within the chord you know doing some mm -hmm. really nice nice stuff so they're gonna they'll just put a bunch of those things uh in 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 the book you know it's meant to be uh kind of an ongoing thing it's 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 gonna include it's all about chord movement you know mm -hmm. and how the notes move between the chords you know which I've been, oh, that's going to be good. fantastic. I never, I don't know, it's just that I was born with uh, that ability to attract guys like Joe Pass to, to back them up, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and anyway, uh, so anyway, we're working on that. It would be a great uh, thing to get this going right now because it'll, uh, <clears throat> with with the book coming out and everything, and if you, if you do some stuff in you know, in China and, uh, Oh yeah, we can get it out. We can get it out to people here too and get, get the buzz going. And, and I think it'll be great to share that with everyone. The, well, I'll, you know, be, I'll the keep it posted here. on that side of it, but knowing that it's there, but, uh, so. We had the GI bill. I, I was about to start the college, uh, the, Manhattan School of Music and paid the tuition, everything else. And I got a call from Chico Hamilton to take Jim Hall's place with, with uh, Chico's band. That was oh. in 1956, 57. Mm -hmm. I stayed with Chico for two years and then wound up 
moving here, you know, and, and so I've been in California ever since. Right. When you were playing with Chico, were you guys traveling a lot? In those, oh yeah, in those couple yeah. Of years? Oh yeah, we, mm -hmm. we did a lot of touring. We would go out, uh, you know, we went out from here. In those days, it was driving. You know, we had two two station wagons, and <laughs> we, uh, we had we had different. Uh, stops, you know, the jazz, there were jazz clubs all over the country at the time. It was like, and you could get a gig there, and the gigs lasted uh, usually two weeks, sometimes even more than that, oh, wow. you know. And we'd be there every night, you know, we'd, we'd open up and we'd get in the Midwest, we'd go to Milwaukee and do a, a jazz club there in Milwaukee, then go to Chicago, and from Chicago, we might go into New York, Philadelphia, and uh, and you know different parts of that that area right. pennsylvania so when you went out on the road you would you go out for you know a month or two at a time then if, if you were well we would you, like, you know it took, we if if we went out it would be a, at least a month or two because you know uh like i say the shortest gig was probably two weeks some longer and then we we'd also have other concerts and, and things, so we would wind up we we'd leave Los Angeles and we could be gone for at least a month and, wow. and longer, you know. And would you guys you'd be playing probably what six nights a week or every night maybe? Oh yeah, we would work. Uh, I think we they usually they usually gave us a night off, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like you know maybe yeah maybe maybe you know six nights yeah because it's still wow one. Yeah. You know, and, one of uh, my, I, 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 I've been listening a lot to this uh, album you, you guys did together of the Ellington Suite and Eric Dolphy is on the album oh, as well. Yeah, and I yeah. absolutely love your playing on that. And, and, and I love it too, because the first track, you know, the, the first solo that starts off the album is a guitar solo <laughs> and it's oh, swinging so hard. What, what acts were you? You know what guitar were you touring with back then? What, what were you playing on the road? I was playing. I, w I was playing for the early part of that. I was playing a, a my D Angelico, which I had built in 1953. Uh, oh, you know, wow. by John D Angelico. Uh, at one point, uh, I I used to go up to D Angelico, and you know he. He knew me. He was like, you know, because when I was younger, my dad would take me up, and I, we, you know, so he knew he knew me. He would he remember, my, you know, me, and we, so uh, D'Angelico. At one point, one time when I came back to L.A., I always was intrigued with the 175 sound, the S 175, and I, I, I had one. I think I had one even before. Chico started. I don't know where I, the original one, but to make a long story short, I had the D'Angelico. Uh, I mean, I, I was playing the D'Angelico, but I needed a little more edge uh, to the sound, you know? Mm -hmm. The, the, the I mean, the, uh, the D'Angelico, I, I needed more of a, a jazz quality, but still have the the quality and and I went one day with to John and I said uh, D'Angelico I said I brought the 175 and he uh, and I, I still remember the words you know and he he, he really liked me and I, 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 I can still picture myself standing there holding and I, I asked him if he could put an ebony neck on the on the on the fingerboard you know and and he was nice enough and he's, he's looking he looks at me he said he said, "What do you want this piece of shit for anyway?" He <laughs> 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 was critical of, the, of any instrument because you know when he made an instrument, it was you know quality all the way. So he said, "Okay, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it for you, John." You know, and uh, I said, "Thanks." And uh, it took about a year before he got to it. It was up on the top shelf, you know. And and when I was leaving Chico in in fifty. Uh, uh, like the latter part of 57, I called him and I said, you know, I'm not going to be coming back here too often. I said, you know, what's happening? He said, oh, hey, it's uh, it's almost finished. And <laughs> we're still up on the top shelf, you know. But right. then uh, I finally 
got him and uh, and he he finished it up uh i picked it up he because that shop was always so busy he said look he said what are you doing this must have been in uh, 50 57 he said what do you uh, easter sunday he said if you came in i'll finish the guitar up for you and and so it was easter sunday and there was nobody in the shop everything was close so i came, i went up there and and he was actually finishing the guitar up and i hung out for a couple of hours while he was finishing it up you know and wow. i took it with me and I, I used that after quite probably most of the time you know and uh I still have that. I still have that instrument. You know, I, I, that's that's a keeper for me. I mean, just a, a lot of uh, a lot of memories there. You know? I'll bet that's yeah. history. I see. Wow. And yeah. the, and then so you were with Chico Hamilton for those two years, and then what what yeah. came next after that? I left. The, I left the band in in '58. And Fred Katz, who was a cellist, he 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 was uh, he he had a gig uh, that he picked up working for Decca Records, and he did a whole series uh, called Mood Jazz, and wanted to, at that time. That's when I met Billy Bean during the last uh, oh, several months. Okay, and uh, Freddie had heard Billy and I playing, you know, just jamming, and and I I. Uh, he when when I got out of here, he said, "Why don't you get Billy to come out and, and we'll do two albums, you know, which we did, and uh, one of them was making it, and the other was uh, take your pick." Right, I have them both. Yeah, well, Fair Freddie enough. did a lot of arranging on one of them, and they were kind of you know a little mysterious. But we did; we were a little looser on the second one, and and that that's when after those recordings. I started making contacts out here through Freddie, because Freddie was doing a lot of recording too. And uh, I did some stuff with, with Paul Horn, and then connecting with the guitarists here, like Al Viola, and uh, guys like Bobby Bain, mm. and uh, Howard Roberts. You know, I wound up doing part of uh, Howard, uh, part of an album with uh, Howard Roberts. And then connecting with uh, with Joe, of course, doing that. Sure. But maybe they all they needed was a rhythm track added to the original track, you know. Oh, okay. So uh, I would do all kinds all kinds of stuff. Working not a lot of rock bands, but at that time, most of the music kind of leaned in that direction, you know. What was a lot of the studio work? I mean. I imagine it must have been mixed. Like sometimes it was for artists, or was sometimes was it for commercials and TV and things as well? Or uh, well, a lot of I, I wound up doing there was a lot of movie stuff that I did. Oh, okay. You, so mm -hmm. I would get a record regular series. I was going to MGM uh, every week, and and I and actually it's interesting because the, the guy that that was conducting and did most of the music was uh, George Van Oet's brother, you know, oh, and he's wow. a piano player. Yeah, what was his name, John, it was John? Anyway, George's brother, who was a real sweet guy, he, he would, if he wrote something that was a little strange looking on the paper, and he didn't play guitar, but he had psyched out knowing that what string you know and he like before the session sometimes he'd say john he said look at this i want you is this comfortable to play and i'd i'd say yeah he said yeah well i thought you could play that note on the third string it <laughs> wow. was kind of like george george was a genius you know and so i wound up uh, uh at the time uh it was you know you you could make you know, like I remember some weeks I'd make eight, eight or nine hundred dollars a week just doing like doing two and three sessions a week in a day. I mean, you know, wow. sometimes a day where you, mm. you do, you know, you get a call and you go in and do one thing. So you'd have like at least four or five guitar players 
Uh, wow. And sometimes, uh, if you're doing movie calls, you'd have you'd wind up. Uh, you have to look at the music when you got it because it could be a mandolin, like a whole mandolin part, you know. Sure. And you had to do that. So I had all you know all of the instruments available. They were always in the trunk, you know. Right. <laughs> doing movie calls, you didn't know what you were going to be playing. So you, I don't, uh, you know, the guys would get there early because. If you play another instrument, it's a double, so you're making half again what you would make for one hour. You know, so you're you're making a lot of extra money with du- like with doubles. You know, I mean, I mean, it's, 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 how many doubles do you have? Well, I had three doubles today, so they the, the, the money goes up. So you, could, you know, you could make some pretty good bread in those days. You know? Wow. So and, in a typical week, you were play, doing studio session work during the day, and then go play the clubs at night. Yeah, yeah, I was doing a a lot of uh, regular club dates and, you know, maybe five, six nights a week. And this period of time, we're talking, what, this would have been the 60s? Uh, That was, yeah, that was in the 60s. Uh, Herb Alpert called me to, you know, about the Tijuana Brass, which, which I was... I was not too keen on it, and I kept on kind of fluffing him off, you know. <laughs> we, we talked about this the other day. I talked to Herb, and, and, and he knew it. He knew that I was busy, but he wanted me, because I had rehearsed with him, and, and we did some. And he liked the way I played the, the rhythm I was playing and wanted me on the band. And, and uh, finally, he was... The band was originally, the first two or three albums he did were a studio musicians like with Tommy Tedesco and the guys. But then it got so popular and the albums were selling. So his uh, uh, managers, they said, we have to put together uh, a performing group to tour around to promote everything. And and that's that's when he started putting a band together. So the first one of the uh, the first tour he was doing it wasn't even a tour it was like two weekends uh in in seattle washington uh, at the hotel edgewater beach hotel i remember and uh we wound up doing uh on a weekend we would do two or three shows and and i was like I was amazed. I mean, I couldn't imagine. The people were going nuts and they were, they were sold out, you know. And then Herb wanted to keep me on the band, so he he uh, he heard some songs that I had written and he asked me if I'd bring some stuff to him. And he, so he, and, and those were million selling albums. Wow. So he, he, he put a tune that I just like a throwaway thing and he put it on his one of the albums and it was you know meant a lot of money and royalties you know. and then after that I, I had at least one or two tunes on all of the albums you know. and they all were for a long time they were selling over a million you know, it was a big group you know wow we were as big sales we were we were actually bigger than than the Beatles even on the charts you know Herb's albums were on the charts and the Beatles were kind of coming in and we even had a chance to hang out with the, the Beatles one one time when we were, when we were in England, you know. It was just a, just a group, just the, just us, you know, our band and their band and their band, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How cool is that? So, like, I mean, before Eastman, you were playing your, your D'Angelico. I know you got an old Epiphone, your 175. You know, what yeah, were some... I, sorry? I endorsed, uh, I endorsed Guild for a while. Oh. Uh, Guild guitars around the time that... Uh, uh, I have a great picture with because Johnny Smith had... A, uh, he was using... He was endorsing Guild. Mm-hmm. I have a great picture with Johnny holding. Actually, it's my guitar. They wanted him to take a picture. He didn't have a guitar, so he, he <laughs> took a picture with my guitar. You know, but uh, Guild—they were good. They were very generous. 
and, and talked to me about it. He said, you should see, you, you should check out this guitar. And it was about time of the NAND show. And he said, you should check it out. He said, they have a booth here. And I went there to, to, to take, check the guitars out, you know, cause Bob thought they were great guitars. And, uh, I went there and, and I've, they had about maybe half a dozen guitars. And this one guitar I played was like really great. And I wound up, they didn't, they didn't know who I was, not uh, whether it would make a difference, but they, they said they weren't, I wanted to buy it. And they said they weren't able to do it because uh, you know, it didn't, you know, but then one of the guys that worked there, Saul, yeah, you know, Saul was, but it wasn't even Saul, it was somebody else. And th they said, no, you should get this guy because he's, you know, he's, he's quite prominent. And, and so they told it, uh, I wound up buying, buying that, I still have that guitar. And uh, it's, it's a, an exceptional instrument. Uh, so, yeah, I, so I, it, I remember playing that one with the, the black headstock and the finish got burned off on that, <laughs> that one spot. Well, that, yeah. Well, 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 I was checking out, I was curious about the, the, what the internal structure was. And I put a magnifying glass and I couldn't see in there cause it was dark. And I put, I put a light bulb close by and looking in and had a great time. But then when I moved the light, I noticed <laughs> the finish is hand rubbed finish. <laughs> right. It was, you know, it, the varnish. it's not a finish and it just melted melted the uh, varnish, it's a violin finish, you know. Sure. so I can play better. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I like Sounds this great. Guitar. I think this is a keeper. <laughs> Sounds yeah, great in your hands. <laughs> 